Next we have Gordon Inouye, a Big Island farmer, businessman, and entrepreneur. He is a member of the Hefna um, Marketing Committee and a board member and treasurer of SHAC, the Synergistic Hawaii Agricultural Council. Uh, Gordon is going to give us an update on the Puna Flower Power Cooperative. Before I start, I want to introduce one of my partners, uh, one of the founders of uh, Puna Flower Power, Elton Mao. Please stand up. Come on, Elton. Now, Elton is one of those crusaders that got devastated by the Kilauea eruption. And it was because of people like Elton that PFP became a reality. And so, again, keep that in mind. Anyhow, this is an update of my presentation. Uh, I think I've done an update at all of our uh, growers symposiums. And so I'll, I'll skim through the earlier part, which most of you have seen. Don't try to read it. There's just way too much. Anyway, this is Kapol before the eruption. And as you can see, all the uh, uh, nurseries are there by dark or light colored where you have greenhouses. So you can see how significant the orchid industry was down in Kapoho. But in May of 2018, everything changed. Kilauea erupted. Uh, that's from Halimau Mau. And you were playing golf that day, and that's what you could see. Anyhow, the, the eruption, the lava lakes uh, uh, drained and the lava went down to the East Rift Zone. Now, I know most of you know that lava is very heavy and the upward pressure is very significant. And I'm sure that you've wondered how much upward pressure does uh, lava exert. Anyway, we really don't know, but we can use static conditions using hydraulics a difference in head between Kilauea and the lower East Rift Zone, the density difference in lava versus water, and come up with a calculation. Anyway, under static conditions, it comes out to about 234 tons per square foot. That's the upward pressure on the ground in the lower East Rift Zone. Anyhow... <clears throat> Without, without well, one of the things I wanted to point out, uh, the um, 1960 eruption in Kapoho emitted 160 million cubic yards of lava, and that was very, very significant. In 2018, the eruption discharged a billion, a billion cubic yards of lava in the in a little longer period of time. But the rate of discharge was about three times what we saw previously in Kapoho. Anyhow, without, without any resistance and with tremendous speed, Pele marched to the sea. You can see there it's already entered Kapoho. And in this particular photo, almost half of Kapoho is already covered. And you can see the former greenhouse there of, of Puna orchids being inundated by the, by the lava flow. I mean, it, it was a beautiful greenhouse. <laughs> I got to say, because I built it myself. <laughs> Anyhow, there was no stopping Pele until, obviously, there was nothing left. I mean, it covered everything. The nurseries are all under about 90 feet of lava at the present time. But, you know, being farmers, we are eternally optimistic. You know, every, t every, time, every morning we see the sun come up and we say, thank God. And like the phoenix rising from the ashes, we knew that we could come back. Fortunately, we're all members of HEFTA. And so this is when the HEFTA Orchid Project came together with, with the blessing of uh, Harold T Eric Tanoy and the Hefna board, we put together at the Orchid Park, an ad hoc Orchid Park project. And, you know, everybody, there was a lot of emotion, and everybody was supportive of, of the devastated farmers there. And everyone had great ideas as to what you could do. Uh, we heard talk from politicians about establishing a new Orchid Park. They talked about certain ideas, certain lands that 
areas that could be set up for something like this. But, you know, given our age and our experience, we know that we, if it's going to get done in our lifetime, we better take charge of things ourselves. Anyhow, the timeline, in May 3rd of 2018, the eruption started by August. Uh, you know, over 700 homes are destroyed. Uh, you know, 2,000, 13.7 square miles of land were covered by, by lava. And by August 15th, the lava flow subsided. So we all took a big breath. We, <clears throat> we formed an ad hoc committee to see what could be done to expedite all from, from all sides. And anyway, many different ideas were thrown out there. And of course, the needs of that community were diverse. We had 700 homes destroyed. People needed basic essentials. Again, the farmers had to kind of take a back seat in this case. And there was a need to coordinate the activities. And so the ad hoc committee put together a, a meeting of uh, the affected growers, members of the community, invited politicians and, and, and landowners. And uh, the, the most active person, bless her soul, was Diane Lay, who represented the County of Hawaii R&D Department. Fortunately, <clears throat> at that time, Bill Walter was president of W. H. Shipman. He made it very, very clear that the company stood behind the farmers and was willing to help. Unfortunately, he, he was scheduled to retire in December, at the end of December in, in 2018. So he introduced us to his, ne her, his niece, Peggy Farias, and Oliver English, director of operation. Peggy was the um, uh, successor president of W.H. Shipman. And before too much longer, the, the, the team put together a 50-acre draft orchid park along uh, Railroad Avenue, just south of Keau. And it was outlined there with, you know, 10 five-acre parcels that could be uh, parceled out for an orchid farm or orchid nurseries. <clears throat> anyway, there was a cr criteria for land selection, most of which are pretty obvious. When we finally put this member of, uh, of understanding together with Shipman, we brought everyone together and laid out the plan for the 50-acre orchid park. And all of the, um, as many of the interested uh, orchid uh, growers were invited to it. Some were willing to start back up, but many were devastated and broken. What we had would be raw land and the amount of infrastructure and time, effort, investment necessary to make it a reality seemed insurmountable. So some of them simply said, no, I'm done, I'm retired, I'm beaten. And you can't blame them, because that was the case. It was a pretty desperate effort. However, a small number of growers, and then I mentioned Elton in particular, you know, says, heck, why not? Let's give it a go. And then that's what gave birth to uh, Puna Flower Power, which was organized in 2019, April of 2019, with three members. With only three members and the prospect of a downsize operation, uh, an alternate site was considered. Um, as most of you know, uh, Puna Rock is located is a quarry company. They sell rock, aggregate, uh, all kinds of material to the to the public, and they they do it under license to W. H. Shipman. And you can see it there on the right hand side of the of the photo there. But the question is, what do you do with the quarry after you finish quarrying? And it's ag zone. And so the clear possible solution is, hey, would a nursery fit here? And of course we said, hey, why not? Anyhow, Russell Kawhi, and I say a former Hefna member, and I was corrected, he's still a Hefna member and an owner of Puna Rock. He cooperated with the PFP to make the project a reality and that was, the whole issue was supported by Shipman and company. Now, the beauty of this all is that Shipman only allows him to quarry down to a certain depth. And so 
he has to move laterally each year to get more and more rock. And so what that does is it provides more area for expansion for PFP in the future. I think he'll generate more land than we can use effectively, unfortunately. And so a revised and updated plan was developed. Uh, the white area represents the quarry area and the upper right-hand corner. You'll see the area that was uh, carved out for license for use by Puna Flower Power. So the layout for the nursery uh, comprised of about three and a half acres at full build out of about eight greenhouses on 6.7 acres. And anyway, those were the, the first general plan developed by Puna Flower Power. And of course, the plans are downsized to accommodate just a few growers at this point. And by the end of 2019, Hefner was able to get funding to build two greenhouses. And this was the first container uh, that was delivered with the first greenhouse in there. The old section of the quarry, of course, was used as sort of the dumping ground where old equipment was parked and left to rust. And you can see there, those are all old dead equipment there in that portion of the, uh, uh, the quarry. Over the next few months, you know, Russell Kawai and his crew worked really, really hard in clearing out the equipment uh, and grading the area all the way to the beginning of 2020 when we had exceptionally wet January. But the, the bulldozers kept going, they kept grading, and as you know, he used a D9 just to, to create the, the, the grade necessary to build until by late February of 2020, uh, the, the ground was prepared and ready to start building. Anyhow, that's Russell admiring his grace work there in a green shirt. We put a team together to start putting the first greenhouse together in March of 2020. And of course, you know, they move very quickly. And by uh, May of 2020, the first structure, the, uh, the structural uh, side of the greenhouse was completed. The, um, the funding we had, of course, only covered the construction of the first two greenhouses. But the state of Hawaii had an uh, emergency loan program, uh, which was due to expire in June of 20, 2019. Anyhow, PFP petitioned the Board of Agriculture to extend the time to submit a proposal, which they did through June of 2020. In, um, in, uh, in May of 2020, uh, PFP submitted a, a request for an emergency loan from the Department of Agriculture. It was put on the agenda for August 18th of 2020, and a loan for $479,870 was approved by the Board of Agriculture. And the loan was funded and closed in October of 2020. Parallel to that, uh, the County of Hawaii received emergency loans from the federal government and uh, Ashley Kirk, Councilwoman Ashley Kirkwoods introduced uh, County of Hawaii Bill 146 Ordinance 2028 on March 25th, 2020. The council uh, unanimously approved the bill on April of 2020. And uh, the, the county was able to put an RFP out there but it wasn't published until uh, mid-July of 2020 with a two-week deadline in terms of submitting a proposal. Anyhow, it was restricted to 501c3 organizations. So Puna Flower Power partnered with the Big Island Resource Conservation Development Council and applied for the grant. We were one of the few grants that was, uh, was supported 100% by the County of Hawaii and the award was made in September 2020 and funded in January of 2021. So between the county grant and the Department of Ag Loan, the PFP was able to complete construction of almost uh, 60,000 square feet of greenhouse and commence operations in 2021. Um, we also, uh, uh, through SHAC, applied for an EDA grant uh, 
as part of the Department of Commerce, and this was an emergency loan for disasters in 2018. And that loan, that, that program specifically delineated eruptions, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and natural disasters in 2018. Our application was favorably received, but they, re they, they mandated that we have some degree of match funding. So again, we put our application on hold, and of course we applied for the emergency loan from uh, the state of Hawaii and for the county grant. By the time we got both of them in place by the latter part of 2020 and went back to the EDA, they said, yes, fine, this would work. Unfortunately, we've committed all the funds and there are no funds left. So out of the whole bill, I think it was $476 million, which was targeted to help the Kauai floods as well as the eruption funds here, Hawaii got $0 out of that $476 million. And we were really disappointed because, as I say, it was earmarked for specifically for floods and, and a volcanic eruption. However, if it's gone, it's gone. It wasn't available. So with the loss of future funding, uh, PFP scaled back its plans to the first three greenhouses and to see what we could do with that. So in the meantime, the work continued to greenhouse number one by laying out weed mats throughout the entire greenhouse. And we got a container load of benches uh, from overseas and installed them in greenhouse number one. And I think you remember seeing the gray container which brought in the first, con first uh, greenhouse parts and the brown container brought in the, uh, the parts for the first benches. Anyhow, those were pre-planned and we purchased them so we could use them as the foundation for our, our, uh, our photovoltaic system. As you can see, what we did is we put trusses across those containers and installed a photovoltaic system on one side of it and the rest of the equipment inside. So electronically, electrically, the, uh, the, the uh, nursery is totally self-sustaining. And of course, we don't have county water there, but so we have at this stage one 20,000 gallon construct, uh, storage tank and a pump house. Uh, we have subsequently constructed a second 20,000 uh, gallon tank and we're still very short on water. By June of 2021, operations started. You can see we planted a bunch of seedlings in greenhouse number one. And we also were able to acquire larger plants from our, one of our partners, namely Mr. Elton Mao, which again enabled us to get the market sooner. In the meantime, we started work on greenhouse number two, next to greenhouse one. And that's our team there working up way up the sky. I couldn't look, I couldn't do that myself. <laughs> Anyhow, by November of 2021, greenhouse number two structure was completed. And then shortly thereafter, the, the greenhouse benches and irrigation system was installed. And the pad for house number three was started. And finally, you can see the grading, final grading on the um, pad number three, finally completed. And here you can see construction starting on a greenhouse number three in November, 2021. Anyhow, this photo shows greenhouse number three almost complete in June of 2022. And this is an overview of all three greenhouses right now you can see number one, two, and three, the tops of one, two, and three. And now we have a few plants for sale. We started selling plants in June of 2022. And in August of 2022, we started shipping some to off island. These are some of the, some of the more mature orchids that we're selling. And right now we're finding the uh, market to be very, very receptive with no market resistance at all. You can see on the left here, uh, the carts which we use to bring uh, plants to the 
packing site. On the right-hand side, you see plants that have been prepared and wrapped, ready for shipping. Then they get packed in a box and then off to FedEx. Anyway, that's our hardworking crew. Right now, Puna Flower Power is totally dependent upon part-timers because, again, we don't have the volume or the, or the staff that can carry on on a full-time basis. Anyway, we've come a long way. We're a for real business, uh, but we have a long road ahead right now. Uh, right now, you know, we're still operating a negative cash flow. And we're projecting that to be the case for the next six months. And so we're being careful stewards of our funds. And, uh, you know, we have plants coming online, but again, our growth and everything else has to be decelerated and hold on. In the meantime, we're working with a number of different funding sources to see what we can do to develop a training program. We're looking for more uh, funding for, for infrastructure and we're looking for marketing help too. So anyhow, uh, it's, been a, it, it's been a three year, four year road, but uh, we have many people to thank. First and foremost, Hawaii Floriculture and Nursery Association, which has stood tall all the way. The Synergistic Hawaii Agricultural Council uh, with, uh, has been very instrumental in seeking grant funds and is still looking for opportunities. Big Island Resource Conservation and Development Council. By the way, Glenn Sacco is the director of Big Island Resource uh, and Conservation Council, too. And, you know, clearly their support and willingness to, uh, to partner with us on a, applying for the Big Island Grant was very, very important. Of course, the Hawaii State Department of Agriculture. Uh, Dean Matsukawa was chair, uh, head of the Ag Loan Division, and he was wonderful to work with. Of course, he has since retired, and I don't who's taking his place at the present time. Uh, WH Shipman and Company has been just an amazing landowner to work with. Again, they're very, very pro-agriculture uh, pro and are doing whatever they can to make, uh, help us along the way. The County of Hawaii Department of Research and Development, again, has been working closely with us, and we'll be working closely with them to develop a training program at uh, PFP. Of course, we're in Councilwoman Ashley Kirkowitz's district, and of course, her support has been just amazing. And again, there have been so many others that have been instrumental in supporting the effort and, and, and lending their help and advice along the way that we want to thank. So that is my presentation. I hope I kept you awake and uh, <laughs> didn't put you to sleep. Any questions? Thank you very much.